Thank Caroline. You. Uh, Caroline, sorry to interrupt you. I did want to just make one more note before you get started. Of course. Um, uh, just about the map in the bottom uh, um, right hand corner of the screen. So this is our walking path today. Caroline will kind of guide you through this path. Um, but it is to give you just a little bit of perspective as to where we would be walking today. Um, Jen will be sharing a link to a Google map that will allow you to pull this up in a larger format um, on your phone or computer while you are watching the presentation if you need a little bit more guidance and a little bit more perspective on um, on how we're walking, what part of the neighborhood we're walking in today. So uh, thank you and without further delay, uh, Caroline will start the tour. Thank you so much, Haley and Jen. Thank you Dwelling Place and Heartside Neighborhood for inviting me to participate and especially to Downtown Grand Rapids Inc. for their help with funding. And welcome back to those who toured with us last week. We are going to kind of build on that foundation and welcome to new uh, walkers today. I want you to start by uh, envisioning here we are standing at Studio Park Plaza, which you see on your screen, and then close your eyes for a moment. And I want to take you time traveling, okay? to the year 1900. And at that point, our rapidly growing city has about 1900, about 90,000 people. And it's now linked to all parts of the nation through the major railroads. And to accommodate the expanded passenger and freight service, a larger union station, the train depot, has just opened here. Now, it was in 1858, the first train station, first uh, railroad service came to Grand Rapids, but that train station was up at the corner of Plainfield and Leonard. So this is now downtown. And this new station replaced an earlier structure, which actually dates back to 1870. Now this new structure is an impressive sight to imagine, bustling with people. By 1918, the era of peak rail travel in the US, more than 12,000 people pass through the Union Station each day. Now the Georgian Revival Depot was two stories tall and composed of red brick. It had an impressive two-story portico with Greek ionic columns covering the sidewalk, sheltering passengers from bad weather like a day like today as they arrived. And Haley is the, are you still sharing the screen, the presentation? Haley uh, actually lost connection and is going to be jumping back on in just a second to share oh. the presentation. So she said she's working on reconnecting. So you could keep with storytelling and then maybe we could catch up with the visual. You really have to imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're at that front entrance of this gorgeous uh, uh, train depot. Now, uh, the central pavilion was topped with a pretty domed cupola with four clock faces that kept departing passengers on time. And we're gonna see in a screen a picture of that on the roof of the central entrance. And then I'm gonna tell you where you can go see that clock today, okay? Now, behind the station was a large train shed built in 1890. The shed sheltered seven tracks and as many as 70 passenger cars. This was a big deal. It was almost one mile long. But in spite of its grandeur and its historical significance, the State Highway Department demolished Union Station in 1958 to make way for the construction, of course, of US 131. Now, I think of that as an interesting and apt replacement uh, symbolically because the reign of the automobile was at the expense of the railway as king of transportation in our nature. And here's an interesting little fact. The train shed was dismantled and today portions of it still exist. It was reassembled by private owners and are in use as warehouses 
south of the city, ironically, along US 131 in the Wyoming area. Now, the, there was a watchtower in the shed area, and that was moved to this business storage yard at 900 Hall Street Southwest. So if today you go to 900 Hall Southwest, you'll see signs for a big company called Columbian Logistics Network, and it's a transportation company that's actually located out of Granville, but they have this huge warehouse off of Hall. If you're on Hall, uh, you will see this big yellow uh, uh, signal station that was preserved from the original Union Depot. So if you go down there today or on another day, you'll see that preserved. Now, I mentioned the beautiful clock tower that was on top of the entrance of the Union Station. You won't believe this, but that graciously sits upon a beautiful private backyard today on Edgemore in East Grand Rapids. So there is, so this is right off of Wealthy and Edgemore. It's a beautiful little neighborhood. It takes a little loop. And if you drive slowly, you'll see one of those backyards. It's kind of like a side yard, so it's visible. You will see that domed cupola with the clock faces. Very cool. Now, in addition to expressway access in this area, this once depot property was developed into the Van Andel Arena. So where this big train station I'm describing existed is now Expressway Access and the Van Andel Arena. So the arena, of course, opened in 1996, and it was considered a game changer and catalyst for downtown development. It's home to the AHL's uh, Grand Rapids Griffins, which you know, plus it boasts an absolutely eye-popping concert and event schedule. The arena thrust Grand Rapids into the forefront of the entertainment industry. It has a 12,000 seating capacity. The arena welcomes more than 700,000 visitors on 120 plus event days each year. Now, it was the first major project and anchor of entertainment in the neighborhood, and it earned uh, the lead in the title, the Arena District, which is our entertainment district within Hartzeg neighborhood is referred to as the Arena District. Now, if you were to drive by the Van Andel Arena today, you would see construction going on. It's like, what's all that? And those are improvements being made to the front of the arena. It's the uh, Grand Rapids Kent County Convention Arena Authority in partnership with Downtown Grand Rapids Inc. They're uh, sprucing things up and there will be trees and grass and places to sit. They're creating a plaza that's more pedestrian friendly. Um, also, here's a realistic point. Since Van Andel opened uh, five years before 9-11, uh, there's been a lot of change in the construction of the fronts of big arenas, and uh, there will be barriers uh, added between Fulton and the arena, you know, uh, not obtrusive to the eye, um, but to protect people gathering from cars running into the arena. That's a million dollar project going on. Now also pretend on the screen right now, you would see a, a picture of the arena with the attachment of the skywalk system. Well, that skywalk system in Grand Rapids is, is just under one mile. It's like 0.9 in length um, and wraps through the hotels and office buildings. and. It runs basically uh, north to south from DeVos Place down to the Van Andel Arena. Uh, it was built in the 1980s when that was a part of the development of convention business. It was very convenient for the hotels to be linked to the convention center. But uh, the last skywalk that was built, because it was added on to the first piece of it in the 1980s was the Amway Grand to the parking ramp and then it was added over time. And, oh, while we've got the screen up, this is beautiful, I want you to look 
at on the right side, see the, the cupola over the front entrance? That's what I was referring to, which is now in East Grand Rapids. You're going to go look that up. And, and, and Haley, if you can go back to, well, no, this is good. See in the lower left corner of the screen you're looking at now, see that signal station that was in the train yard? That's the one that's located at 900 Hall today, painted yellow, preserved. Okay, so Haley, go on and on to the next one. There's the skywalk system that we're talking about. Um, there we go, the skywalk system. So basically what I, what I read recently is that the last skywalk section that was added was the, the connection between the JW Marriott and uh, their parking, and that was 2008. But according to uh, Sam Cummings, uh, the managing principal of CWD Real Estate Investment, he says the cost of, and, and they own and manage 26 buildings downtown, uh, the cost of installing skywalks has grown prohibitive and can mess with historic buildings designs. So that's why they didn't link the row to DeVos place, and they didn't link the AC hotel to the parking across the street. The thought is that the um, more robust our downtown, the less of the need of the skywalk system. They want people to be, have feet on the streets. So that is the evolution of the skywalk system. Okay, so now we are moving on. We are turning left, cutting over to Granville. We're now in front of Bistro Bella Vida. And we're gonna talk about the who a little bit historically. So who exactly arrived on the steamships that we talked about last week or two weeks ago, and eventually on the trains. So in the 1850s, as Grand Rapids was growing in size, Hartside became populated by immigrants. We actually had an immigrant office in Grand Rapids where we went to Europe and recruited immigrants to our city. The area was where people entered. This area of um, the Hartside neighborhood, uh, specifically this uh, Market and uh, uh, Fulton area, that was the gateway. Uh, first, the Irish came to the area in 1835. They helped to build the canal uh, around the rapids of the Grand River. And upon arrival, both discrimination and lack of resources forced many of the newcomers to gather in modest, compact row of one-story clappered houses. And many of the uh, newcomers, as they gathered in this area, uh, they were referred to as living in shanty town. Um, again, at that time, it was located near the riverboat dock, so it was the first place they arrived in the city. And that riverboat dock was situated between the, the natural river canal and the islands that we referred to two weeks ago. And again, about where Fulton and Market Streets meet today. Now, fleeing their own countries uh, because of political or religious persecution, persecution or famine, potato famine, the Dutch, the Poles, the Germans, Italians, Scandinavians, Lithuanians, Greeks, and others followed many eventually finding employment in the furniture factories that of course earned Grand Rapids the title of Furniture City USA. And you'll see in the bottom left corner, that is a picture of uh, they are immigrants that are working in the furniture factory. And then above that are German immigrants who are working in the breweries at that time. So, while the new immigrants, they worked together by day, they settled into distinct, comfortable ethnic neighborhoods where they spoke their home language, socialized, shopped, worshiped, and uh, that uh, shopped and worshiped. And that was, uh, I am together. So this general area was stop number one for the earliest immigrants. Uh, again, cloistered together in crude structures, 
but only until they could accumulate enough of the resources to build a finer houses in their ethnic neighborhoods. And those were basically on the west side, which is a whole different tour, the immigrant neighborhoods on the west side. Now, if we go on on the slides, and we're walking now, you see we were standing in front of Bistro Bella Vida on Weston, and see that uh, building that says Orion on top. Uh, last time we talked about this area because of the uh, wholesale market, the produce market had been basically across the street. There were a lot of wholesale grocery businesses that popped up. Uh, the building that had Orion on the top of it, that's at 32 Market Avenue Southwest. And that was originally a wholesale grocery business. And it was a five-story brick building once used to warehouse groceries that came into Grand Rapids by rail, which were then sent to small stores actually around the state. So that is a few, the, the, the past of that building. And of course, its current tenant is Orion Construction, um, RWS Financial Group, and other businesses. What you see on the photo here was actually on the other side of the street, 37 to 39 Market. And the building in the photo was actually demolished in 1987, but it was built in 1936. But again, it punctuates the, um, the, 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 that point in time, this is an illustration of the market wholesale groceries. In fact, the Bob, as you know, the big old building, that was once a wholesale grocery building as well. Now, we're walking and we begin walking south on Granville and we're on the east side of the street. And our first stop that I wanna make is this beautiful building, the Grand Rapids Community Foundation Building. And when I first moved to town, I passed this building and I thought, that must have been something pretty special. Pretty special, that is a unique building. And indeed, it is. We're gonna talk a little bit about the beer brewing history because through 1875, the beer brewing business in Grand Rapids grew to great proportions. Historically, with a lack of adequate transportation and stored technology, beer was best when it was consumed closest to where it was made, ensuring freshness, you know, locally made, right? You've heard that now, but back then it was real. It was produced locally, consumed locally. But what happened is outside competition from out of state began creeping in. The Toledo Brewing and Malting Company didn't brew in Grand Rapids, but they sold their beers here. And another example is Anheuser-Busch. Now, do you see the origin of the Grand Rapids Community Foundation building, the hint of the origin? Do you see in the top of the building, of the Community Foundation building, there's an insignia up at the top. It's a big A. That terracotta eagle and A insignia is the uh, symbol of Anheuser-Busch. And by the turn of the century, <coughs> Anheuser-Busch was also distributing in Grand Rapids. Now this building was actually built in 1904 and it was considered an ice house because Anheuser-Busch would load their product now on these refrigerated railroad cards, which allowed now brew to be, to travel. And then they would unload in Grand Rapids and they set this network up around the country of ice houses. They could take the beer off the refrigerated train cars, take this right close by to this ice house. And then the next day, the man with the, the peddler in his uh, horse and, and buggy would then go to the individual retail outlets and peddle his beer, competing with our local brewers. So this, uh, these rail side ice houses made this uh, distribution easy and safe. Uh, 
Aside from their historic ice houses on their campus in St. Louis, Anheuser Busch still has these ice houses in St. Louis. Only two of these satellite at um, ice houses uh, remain in the nation. This is one, and the other is now a hobby shop in Van Buren, Arkansas. So we're very, very fortunate to have this building preserved in Grand Rapids, and that Anheuser-Busch logo is still used today. Now, we continue walking south on the east side of Granville, and our next stop, you're gonna see signage for hops and flats. Well, I can't tell you how many people think, because it's located across the street from Founders, that that hops has something to do with Founders. No, 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 no. This building was built by the W.C. Hobson. It's the Hobson Company. And it was founded in 1882 by William C. Hobson. And its industry was actually sheet metal fabricating. Uh, they were known for beautiful metal ceilings, tin ceilings, many still existing in downtown Grand Rapids. Now, the firm erected this building on Granville Avenue after its formal building, which had been on Campo, had burned down. They operated here until at least 1952, even though Mr. Hobson had, he had passed away unexpectedly in 1948. Now, William, Mr. Hobson, had been quite a community leader. In addition to longtime membership in the Peninsular Club, he was active in YMCA affairs, a 32nd degree Mason, in charge of property at Fountain Street Baptist Church, and a one-time Repu Republican chairman of the old Fifth Ward. Today, this building is a loft-style apartment building, Hobson Flats, and it appeals to mostly students. Now we're gonna cross the street to the, what I am told, is the number one Uber destination in Grand Rapids, Founders. And of course, it all started with a couple of Hope College buddies. Mike Stevens and Dave Engbers, who first opened a brewery on the north side of Grand Rapids in 1997. Now, they called that company Canal Street Brewing Company. Well, it was called Canal Street Brewing Company because Monroe, as we know it today, was once called Canal Street, and that was until 1912. And that was because Canal Street ran parallel to the canals on the river, the Grand River. So today, Founders LLC name is still Canal Street Brewery, a neat homage to our past. Now, that opening in 1997 of Canal Street Brewing ended a 46 year, what we would refer to as a beer drought in downtown Grand Rapids. And that was since the 1951 closing of Fox Deluxe. And you see a sample of their beer bottle, Fox Deluxe Brewing Company. Now that was the, um, uh, end stage of the consolidation of seven breweries in 1893 that consolidated to ward off competition from Anheuser-Busch. And they formed the Grand Rapids Brewing Company. Okay? Now that's the original Grand Rapids Brewing Company and the Fox Deluxe Company bought Grand Rapids Brewing Company post-prohibition. Now their big compound, the castle, as it was often referred to, was on Michigan, where the state of Michigan building is today. Okay, now back to founders. I'm throwing in a lot of facts here. So this current location that you're looking at opened in 2007, and that had once been an old truck warehouse. Now their philosophy of founders is that we make beer for people like us, brewed for us. In 2014, founders sold 30% of the company to a Spanish brewing giant named Mahao San Miguel 
that sale stripped founders of its craft designation as independently owned. Then in August of 2019, founders announced that the same Spanish beer conglomerate purchased 90% stake in founders, but the original owners, Mike and Dave, they still own 5% each. So the local company remains autonomous in managing the business. They opened a second tap room in Detroit. People now travel to this Granville Avenue business from around the world to visit the shrine to the craft brewing industry. And really cool brewery tours are available by booking on their website. Now, we're moving south, continuing south on this west side of the street, and we're going to the next historic building, and it was constructed by an enterprising Dutch businessman. I'm not Dutch, so I don't know if it's stoop or stoop, but either or. Dutch businessman, LVD Stoop, in 1891, he built this as a hotel and a retail grocery store, and it catered to all those railroad travelers passing through Grand Rapids. Its address is 333 Grandville, but the building has a very, very colorful history. And if we go back to, um, go backwards, Haley, to the previous slide, the one before that. There you go. Michigan is an interesting state. In 1916, Michigan voters, Michigan voters approved a statewide prohibition of the sale of intoxicants, including beer, wine, and liquor. So this was before federal prohibition. We had a very, very strong temperance movement in early in the state of Michigan, but particularly in Grand Rapids. Now this law, and that's why you see this no beer, we want milk, adorable. Uh, the law took effect in 1918. Now this 18th amendment to the US Constitution turned the whole nation dry in 1919. And Michigan was the first to ratify that 18th Amendment. Now, prohibition ended with the 21st Amendment in 1933. Interesting, Michigan was the first state to ratify that amendment. First to go dry, first to be wet. So that's an interesting part of our prohibition history. Now, as you know, prohibition did not stop the consumption of liquor. You've heard of speakeasies. So now, Haley, go forward, forward, there you go. So speakeasies was a nickname for those bars because speak patrons, and I don't know if you know this about why they got the name speakeasies, but they had to whisper, whisper codes to enter the establishments. They had to speak easy. So even in conservative Grand Rapids, we had a number of speakeasies. So this grand old structure is proof. So recently, a business that moved into the third floor, it would be a uh, tattoo parlor, they reported finding a secret room during the remodeling, complete with evidence of it being a hiding place for alcohol during prohibition. But move forward, starting in the 1940s, you see the Lamar Hotel. This storied property was the Lamar Hotel and Horseshoe Bar. This jazzy club was popular with the Black community because they were denied access to other white clubs in town. The owner, Frank Lamar Sr., also reputedly ran a brothel on the upper floors. The bar and hotel closed in, it was just 1979, following the death of Frank in 1975. The building, as you can see, sat vacant for decades. The Grand Rapids Ballet bought it in 2005, thinking that they may have some use for it, and they needed the parking space. But 
After some time never using the building, they sold it in 2013 to a local realtor who has refurbished it. So there has been, uh, there has been a, a barbecue restaurant there. There's a salon on the second floor, a tattoo parlor on the third floor. But now there is a uh, different business on the first floor um, and the barbecue restaurant no longer exists. So we're going to cross the street to the Grand Rapids Ballet. Now, this actual property here used to be a bus station, the North Star Bus Station. And I don't know if any of you listening ever remember it as the North Star Bus Station. You can let us know in the chat. Back then, when this was the North Star Bus Station, the ballet, Grand Rapids Ballet, was actually rehearsing at the Masonic Center that's on Fulton Street. Well, now, celebrating its 50th anniversary in the coming 2021, wait, no, yeah, 21 22 season, the Grand Rapids Ballet is Michigan's only professional ballet company, professional, paid professional. It was 1971, the Grand Rapids Civic Ballet began of, uh, practicing under the founder, artistic director, Sally Seven. You might recall that name. During the early 1990s, professional dancers were placed under contract for the first time. Today, the professional company consists of over 30 dancers, apprentices, and trainees from around the world under the leadership of artistic director, James Sofranco. Grand Rapids Ballet performs regularly at its own Peter Martin Weggie Theater. You can see in the background there, they perform at DeVos Performance Hall, Forest Hills Fine Arts Center, and various tours throughout the state. They total over 50 performances per season. They moved into this permanent home in the year 2000. But now, let's take a look around the corner at the south-facing wall of this facility. So this artwork mural, which is visible from 131 at Wealthy Street, it was created for Art Prize 8. I love what I refer to as the Art Prize Afterglow, these wonderful pieces that stick around our community well after the artists have packed up and gone home. Well, this mural was created in 2016 by Louise, nicknamed Weezy, Chen. She painted, and this is called Untitled, it's titled Untitled, it's a sprawling floral mural uh, as part of the Urban Institute of Contemporary Art, the UICA's Exit Space Project. Now, Weezy is a mural artist based out of Detroit, but she's transformed walls like this in spaces in Brooklyn, LA, and other places around the world, such as Shanghai. Let's, let's move quickly. Now we're moving north on Granville to engine house number six. What a historical jewel. This building, I love it. It was designed by local architect, William G. Robinson, and it was built in 1879. Now, he also built the, by the way, William G. Robinson designed the Rood Building. You might know that one. In 1872, it's Flanagan's today. Just to give you some perspective, William G. Robinson and also his son uh, were quite prolific architects in early Grand Rapids. Now, this original building was a simple rectangle, and it had a tower on the northwest corner that you see. I think people sometimes mistakenly think it's a lookout tower, a watchtower. Do I see any fires? Well, you know, those towers were not built for looking out, not at all. Those towers were built to hang hoses, fire hoses, because they would get really stiff and mildewy and moldy if they were all bunched up. So old hose had to be hung out its full 50 feet in length to dry, or it would develop a permanent crease. And of course, that wouldn't work. By the mid-1920s, advances in the quality of the, of the hoses, as well as the availability of telephone communication, in case people were up there watching for fires, 
these advancements made towers obsolete. Hose drying is no longer necessary since hose now uh, contains no fabric to mildew and rot. Now, in the late 1960s and the early 1970s, this building itself, engine house number six, it is actually the city of Grand Rapids training company for firefighters. The new firefighters were assigned here for their first year, and this is where they spent their time. And that was a very new concept in training at that time, because prior to that, each new member was assigned to a fire company and received on-the-job training. Now, the engine company was actually decommissioned in 1976, and it became Grand Rapids Public Museum property. The station reopened for a few months in 1989 as quarters for squad one when the engine house number one on the grave was being renovated. Now, it is the oldest building in Michigan, still standing, that was once used as a fire station. How proud we are. Now, engine house number six, the actual operations of that fire company was moved to Burton Street. It is no longer property of the Grand Rapids Public Museum. It has been home to the Anxiety Resource Center since 2005. Now, if we were to turn an immediate right around the corner there, um, you see a horse and uh, a wagon right there, that would be called Ellsworth. That road is Ellsworth. And I just point that out because Ellsworth was actually called Summit Street at one point in time, probably because it, it led to a high point. The name Ellsworth is actually in honor of a gentleman who once owned a large tract of land in this part of the city, as so often the street names are named for that purpose. Now, if we were to continue on Ellsworth and just go down around a curve and down a little slope, we would come to the Vern Ehlers Station. So this is what would be our train station for Grand Rapids. Union Station at one time, then we had a spot for our Amtrak station on the corner of Wealthy and Granville, and then this beautiful station opened in 2014. And the new passenger rail facility is uh, immediately south of, of Central Station, where we're going to be going, which is the Rapid, the, the bus station. And um, this is an important intermodal hub in the heart of our city. So Heartside is our intermodal hub. Now due to steadily increasing, this is great news, ridership on Amtrak, city and state transportation organizations, they began to consider construction of this new and larger rail station in the 2000s. But in order to locate the rail station adjacent to the bus hub, just to the north of it, a spur track was actually built parallel to Ellsworth Road we were just talking about to connect with the CSX, that's the freight main line to the south. Now this new station replaces that smaller Colonial Revival style depot that, would, uh, that was built in 1996 and that's about a half mile west that we talked about. Now this new rail station is named for former Congressman Vern Ehlers, who represented the area, and he helped to obtain federal funding for the facility. The modern one-story building features a richly textured exterior composed of brick, concrete, masonry, horizontal metal siding, and generously sized glass walls that allow natural light to flood the interior. Now the station features a slim, you can see it going up there in the middle of your screen, a slim soaring clock tower, which at night, LED lights from within. Now you may not have known this or appreciated this fact, but it was purposeful because these LED lights create this glow. It's a beacon for travelers. And that was the intent of the architect. Now along the concrete platform, a long canopy of once again offers shelter for the travelers from inclement weather. 
So that is also just like the old station. Now, we go on to the north to the Rapid Central Station. What was built here in 2004 at a cost of $22 million. I don't know how many of you have taken buses from this station. It serves as both a new bus station and a terminus, the end, for our inner city coach routes such as Greyhound and Indian Trails. Now Greyhound moved its operations from 190 Wealthy Street Southwest, which was the corner of Granville Avenue, to be part of this intermodal station. It was the first transportation center in the U.S. to receive LEED certification. So that is, it's a uh, sustainable building built according to green guidelines. As Grand Rapids' major bus transfer point, the station features 16 bays for city buses and four for coaches. Note the wave-like canopy in the back when you see that from your driving around 131, the wave-like canopy. The architects we're honoring the waves of the Grand River, just like DeVos Place, just like the cascading architecture of the Van Andel Research Institute. They are honoring the waves of the Grand River, just like so many other buildings in our city. Now, I ask a question and a favor of all of you, if anybody has insight to the artwork that we are looking at in front of the Central Station, please let me know. I have scoped out all around it. I can't, I've asked Rapid employees. I can't get an answer, so maybe one of you knows. Now, as we conclude, you see Granville Avenue. It began as the gateway to the many, many brave immigrants, the who of Grand Rapids, from around the world who made Grand Rapids their home. And now we are moving forward into the future on this gateway. It is home to some of the city's favorite places to show off, founders, and also our transportation hub to connect us elsewhere. There are pieces of the past, the, um, beautiful fire station still standing to humbly remind us of where we came from. But the street is certainly lined now with positive proof of where we are going. So that concludes today's tour. We would, if we were walking, return to Studio Park by turning east on Sherry and then turning left north on Ottawa behind the Studio Park King Lot. And here we are once again. Thank you for joining me today. And in two weeks, we move a little further west into the Heartside neighborhood. East, east, sorry. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much, Caroline. Big round of applause silently from many of us. Uh, normally at the end of these uh, conversations we've been trying to break out into conversation groups, but today, unfortunately, technology and thunderstorms ate a little bit of our additional time. Just want to say thank you to Downtown Grand Rapids Incorporated for in, uh, providing funding for this project. Thank you to all the community partners who have uh, provided input, but also the photos for today's tour. So the Grand Rapids Public Museum Archive, the Grand Rapids Public Library, the City of Grand Rapids Archives and Records, and the Grand Rapids Historical Commission. So you can see more of this type of content on all of those sites. And the other thing that we wanted to share with all of you today is that Dwelling Place is proudly supported by NeighborWorks America. NeighborWorks America works to support community development corporations providing affordable housing and essential support services across the United States with over 200 affiliated organizations um, we are celebrating NeighborWorks Week uh, by celebrating the history of the Heartside neighborhood, and we're really excited about the opportunity to bring this information to all of you today. Uh, there are a series of six tours as part of this series. We are currently 
on tour uh, number two. So there are four more in the series. I am sharing a link, uh, an Eventbrite link in the chat. Um, you do need to sign up for each tour individually. Apologies about um, the funky link today. We will ensure that we do better next time. Our next tour will be uh, the Entertainment Expedition. We're gonna focus on hospitality. And thank you to everyone who's been providing some feedback in the chat. Just a reminder, one of the additional pieces that we shared in the chat was a link to our, our survey tour, our, our historic tour survey. Please complete that. If you are one of the people trying to attend all of our tours and be eligible for a gift card at the end of the series, you will need to track that. That is how we are actually uh, tracking your attendance. And of course, for anyone who has feedback, thoughts you want to share, you can add them there. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you so much, Haley. Caroline's got something else to add. Yes, for the, for the gentleman who wondered, it's 1879 that the um, uh, engine house number six was built. And also, thank you to the gal who gave me the contact at Ride the Rapid um, uh, dot org for in information on the artwork. Thank you so much. That's Sarah Green. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate that. All right. Uh, thank you, Caroline. Big round of applause. If anyone has technical questions about those links, let us know. We're happy to um, help you navigate that system. Haley and I will stay on for a few minutes to help anyone who might be having technical issues. So really appreciate everyone. Um, please give your round of applause in the group chat for Caroline um, or words of encouragement and support. Also feel free to give us feedback on that survey. Always love to hear your thoughts and we look forward to seeing all of you next time.